Okay, in this video, we're going to talk about books number 41 through 44 of our top 50 best books, health and nutrition books of all time. We're only going to do four in this lecture because they all go together. The remaining books afterwards will be like a separate topic. And the main focus uh, we're going to be talking about in this lecture is things that cause brain damage that cause neurodegeneration and also contribute to psychiatric diseases, anxiety, depression, and whatnot. Okay, so first of all, I want to mention this lady in her book. It's called The Calcium Connection. Her name is Brundy Brody, and she's a nice lady. She's like a business lady or something, but she's very smart. It started off when her child uh, had all kinds of weaknesses. He was sort of like chronically fatigued, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. And so, you know, she was pretty smart and she's kind of wealthy. She went and hired a bunch of scientists to figure out what was wrong with them because the doctors couldn't figure it out. The neurologists couldn't figure it out. And they came to the conclusion that the child had a problem with um, something called uh, the CIRCA. CIRCA stands for Sarcoplasm Endoplasmic Reticulum Calcium ATPase. And basically it's a pump that pumps calcium into the endoplasmic reticulum of a neuron. So I'll show you. Here's a CIRCA pump right here. The letter S really is only related to muscle in a significant way, and that stands for sarcoplasm. The ER here, ER stands for endoplasmic reticulum. And then C is for calcium because it pumps calcium. A is for ATPase because you need to use an ATP to generate the energy to pump the calcium. Calcium is super important. Calcium is the most important ion for activation of brain cells. Basically, you can think of calcium as being like an aristocrat. When calcium concentrations in the cytoplasm increase, that causes a cell to do whatever that cell does. If it was in a skeletal muscle cell, it would contract. If it's in a smooth muscle cell, a cardiac muscle cell, it would contract. So muscle cells contract with elevated cytoplasm calcium. In a brain cell, a neuron, the typical thing is that the neuron will release its neurotransmitter. So this is a super important concept. You have to make sure you know this before anything else goes on. Normally, cytoplasm calcium in a brain cell, in a neuron, I'm just going to say neuron from now on, is very low. And so when it's suddenly elevated, that neuron will release its neurotransmitter. The thing to know is the relative proportions of calcium in the cytoplasm, very low, versus in the extracellular matrix outside the cell, super high. It's literally 15,000 times higher outside the cell than inside the neuron. In addition, inside the neuron, calcium can be stored in the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, but the endoplasmic reticulum is like a reservoir, a concentrated storage of calcium. So whenever you're pumping an ion against its gradient, meaning from a lower to a higher uh, concentration area, you're always going to need energy to do that. So to pump it out of the cytoplasm, outside the cell, you need, you need ATP energy to do that. You can pump it out through something called the NACA exchanger. NA stands for Na for natrium, the Latin for sodium, Ka for calcium. The Latin, you know, and so the NACA exchanger rapidly pumps calcium out of the cell. There's something over here called the plasma membrane calcium ATPase. That also pumps calcium out of the cell, but it's relatively slow. Circa is another way to pump calcium out of the cell, and again, using ATP energy to pump it into the endoplasmic reticulum. One of the key points was that I kept emphasizing you need ATP, and the reason why that's such a big deal, what it means is you need good mitochondria, because most ATP is made in the mitochondria. So one key thing to get out of this slide here, and this is a super important slide, you might want to hit print screen if you're interested in neurophysiology, dementia, and all that, is that you need to be able to control calcium very, very precisely because it activates neurons. And the danger is if you can't control calcium and it goes too high inside the cytoplasm, it will overactivate the cell, and neurons are fragile. They'll just die. So um, that's a key thing. Okay, now how does the neuron do its business. And basically anywhere from 50% to two-thirds, 66% of a neuron's ATP energy is used to run this pump right here, the potassium sodium ATPase. It brings in two potassium, pumps out three sodium, with a net effect that it's bringing in two positive charges and pumping out three 
positive charges such that you're going to develop a negative charge inside the cell. Typical resting membrane potential is about negative 65 millivolts. Okay, so you have a negative charge inside the cell. You'll also have a concentration gradient for sodium whereby it's much higher outside the cell than inside the cell, 10 times higher. What that means is sodium wants to come into the cell. Number one, because it's got a negative charge that it runs toward because it's positively charged itself. It has one, pu one plus as its charge, plus to equilibrate its concentration gradient. The concentration of sodium is 10 times higher outside the cell than inside the cell. Okay, the reason I'm going through all this is this is how a cell works, and this is what explains dementia. All right, the current, you know, conventional theory of Alzheimer's is just stupid. I'm not even going to get into that right now. I actually talked about it briefly with my last lecture where I talked about the Jack Delatory theory. So you might want to look that up in Turning Point. I got a whole bunch of lectures all about that stuff. Okay, what I'm, what I'm moving into now is a more sophisticated, detailed understanding of how the brain works and what causes dementia. And this is not just esoteric, you know, um, mental masturbation nonsense. This is the key to understanding how to protect a brain, okay? Um, lots of people did research on calcium in brain cells, but I can tell you I'm the one who figured out what I call the supply and demand theory and how it all works and how you could prevent dementia. And you don't have to spend any money. You just have to know what to do. Oh, actually, let me just continue on a little bit more with that last cell. So the point of it is that you... You need this. Uh, you need this calcium. I'm sorry. This potassium sodium ATP pump to generate this electrical gradient because it's like a battery. The cell figured out how to use electricity long before humans were ever around. Okay, and because you've got this gradient of sodium, we just talked about an electrical and a chemical gradient. When you allow sodium to come into the cell, you can use that to pump calcium out of the cell. Okay, so those are the three uh, big calcium pumps. Number one, the knock exchanger. That's the fastest one. That's actually the most important one. Uh, then the circa pump. It's also, though, quite important to pump it into the endoplasmic reticulum. And then the plasma membrane calcium ATPase. Okay. Okay, and what happens when you start looking this up at first, you're like, what is circa? You know, that wasn't emphasized in med school residency or neuroradiology. But you start seeing, gee, a lot of things damage circa. When people have lung cancer, circa is damaged, all right? But there's something much more important than that. A lot of other weird things come into play. Bromines. The bromines are often related to uh, flame retardants. So, for example, how does this affect my thinking? As a doctor, if you're in the operating room, there might be use of cautery and you know there's a there's a risk of a fire, and so the blue surgical grounds have the bromine flame retardant in them. But if you're just doing some minor procedure at the best the bedside, suture removal or a fine needle aspiration biopsy, you don't need to wear a bromine gown, okay? So you can just wear some other barrier gown or something so you don't have to expose yourself to bromine flame retardant. That's a circa inhibitor. Okay, um, diabetes will also lead to the formation of advanced glycation end products. In my diabetes lectures, I go all through advanced glycation end products. They're also increased in high-fat foods like nuts, and they're increased especially in high-fat, high-protein foods like meat. Okay, but the point is advanced glycation end products can be damaging to circa. They'll cause a decrease in circa, the ability to pump calcium into the endoplasmic reticulum. And when you've got decreased circa function, that's going to be associated with insulin resistance and diabetes. It's a little bit of a vicious cycle. I'll explain some more of that in just a moment. But um, all of this, there's a big connection between circa and diabetes. So here's kind of like what a screw job it is. If you have a decreased function in circa, that leads to increased insulin resistance. If you have increased insulin resistance, that causes diabetes. Well, guess what? When you have diabetes, you're going to make increased advanced glycation end products, increase advanced glycation end products, decrease circa. It's a vicious cycle. And that's why, man, you want to break out of it. And the smart move, of course, is eat a low-fat diet because high dietary fat causes insulin resistance. And protein also causes insulin resistance in a different way, high animal protein, because it causes like an anabolic phase that causes elevated uh, blood lipids. All right, um, getting now to cortisol. Psychological stress will cause increased release of cortisol into the blood. The purpose of cortisol is in an acute stress phase to rapidly increase 
you know, the, the energy available in the blood, meaning to flood the blood with energy because you need to survive. You're being chased by a tiger in the dark, you know. saber tooth tiger comes at you. You better, what you do in the next 15 minutes determines whether you survive or not. So the cortisol goes to the liver, breaks down uh, glycogen, and you get more blood glucose. Okay, great. But the big point about cortisol for our purposes is that the cortisol will increase the breakdown of fats in the fat tissue that's called lipolysis, and that will release free fatty acids into the blood. Well, the increased blood lipids will then cause insulin resistance. So you see where this is going? Stress increases cortisol, increases lipids in the blood, increases insulin resistance, increases diabetes. That's going to increase AGEs. That's going to inhibit circa. So this is another reason why, there's many reasons why diabetes makes people stupid. And I can tell you, like the three categories of the stupidest patients I encounter on a routine basis are number one, diabetics, diabetics by far. Number two, kidney failure patients. I just don't see that many kidney failure patients. Number three, um, obstructive sleep apnea patients, okay? And sleep apnea often goes with diabetes. But I'm just letting you know, you see the vicious cycle here. Excessive chronic severe stress activates insulin resistance and it predisposes you to diabetes. And I think this is part of why too. Some people are believe that they're eating reasonably well, but if they're excessively chronically stressed out, they're gonna be more prone to having refractory uh, diabetes, for example, refractory hyperlipidemia because the cortisol keeps releasing lipids into the blood. The other thing that's making a lot of people have refractory obesity is because they're exposed to so many estrogens and estrogens a fat storage hormone. It makes them want to gain weight. So if you're having trouble, trouble losing weight, some of the things I would say is get your stress under control, avoid caffeine, and also avoid these estrogenic chemicals. Okay, um, these are all things associated with decreased levels of circa function. So basically, her book got me interested in circa. Then I started reading about it quite extensively, and I came to the conclusion, you don't want to do anything, that, you don't want to avoid anything that smells bad. Anything that smells bad probably one way or the other leads to decreased circa, and you want to manage your stress. Okay, so we're not going to go into all that. Um, some other interesting things. Nitric oxide helps to improve circa function. So the same things that are improving nitric oxide uh, tend to be good for circa, which all makes sense. And that you're going to see this is a common pattern in the human body. The things that are good tend to be good in multiple ways. The things that are bad tend to be bad in multiple ways. And that's also why a patient who's getting better tends to keep getting better. A patient who's getting worse tends to keep getting better worse. So if they're getting better, quite often the thing to do is get out of the way, let them just heal. On the other hand, if they're getting worse, put some more effort into figuring out what's wrong because you want to stop it before uh, it progresses too far and there's irreversible damage. Okay, things associated with decreased circa function. Like I said, all the diabetes stuff for the reason we showed that vicious cycle. Uh, but a lot of chemicals are toxic to circa. Processed food is full of toxic chemicals. Okay, we're not going to go into all that stuff, but there's a whole bunch of recreational drugs are also toxic to circa, including ETOH, alcohol, tobacco, MJ. They're all bad, okay? All right, so that was book 41, Brunda Brody's Calcium Connection. Now we're on book 42, and this is my book, The Poor Man's Way to Prevent Dementia and Raise IQ. So like I said, as I got a little older and I switched from being a surgeon where I was on call every day basically, first call or backup call, to being a neuroradiologist where on my days off, I had a day off. I wasn't on call. My kids are grown up. I don't spend that much time with the wife, obviously. So I'd sit around reading. And, you know, like I said, I figured out all the internal medicine books are wrong. All the internal medicine subspecialties are wrong. They're just stupid, okay, because they try to force everything to be based on drugs. But in reality... It's just not uh, based on drugs. These are my two wrestling coaches. That's Dave Schultz and Mark Schultz. They both were world and Olympic champions. They both were really good to me at Stanford and helped me a lot. I learned more from them than any of my professors. So anyways, I'm then going to go into, you know, how I put together what's going on with dementia, uh, the best theory. It is multifactorial, and Delatorre's theory is really good. Tetsumori Yamashima's theory is really good. And, and my theory, those are the three best theories by far, and they tell you exactly what to do. For Yamashima's theory, you avoid omega-6 cooking oils completely, okay? For uh, the deletory theory is mostly like atherosclerosis risk factors, so you want to avoid those. So that was sort of like an internal medicine doctor's wet dream, okay? He explains why all that internal medicine stuff uh, is good for you, all right? 
My, mine goes a level farther than that. And that's another way I think that I totally surpass most of these uh, internal medicine-based uh, backgrounds uh, and family practice-based backgrounds because they're not thinking about the brain in an honest, comprehensive way, whereas I am. Um, and that'll make sense in here in just a moment. For an internal medicine doctor, you know, their ultimate holy grail of health is to keep the coronary arteries open to the heart because the most common cause of death is heart disease. And the wonderful thing about that, simultaneously, most things that prevent heart disease also markedly reduce the risk of cancer. Yay, that's great. Okay, but what I'm going to say is there's a lot of things, like I joke about, you know, the line from Hamlet, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. When Hamlet was speaking to Horatio, there's a lot of things that affect the brain that don't affect the heart that much and aren't that related to cancer. The brain is more sensitive, okay? So here's the anatomy of a brain cell, of a neuron. This is the cell body region where you've got the nucleus with the DNA, you've got a lot of mitochondria here. These are the dendrites, incoming sensory information. If the, the neuron decides to fire an action potential, it typically begins right here at the beginning of the axon. It's called the axon hillock, and it transmits the action potential down to the synaptic terminal, the axon terminal. Okay. Um, this is myelin. It's a wrapping in fat that actually speeds up neuronal conduction because instead of having to go continuously, it kind of jumps over the myelin. It's called saltatory uh, to jump, and it jumps and it's fast, okay? Uh, here's the presynaptic neuron. It's terminal. These are neurotransmitter vesicles. They will travel to the plasma membrane, merge with it, release their neurotransmitter, diffuses across synaptic cleft, binds to a receptor on the postsynaptic neuron, and it activates the postsynaptic neuron, and that's how neurons communicate. Okay, now here's a little more detail on it. The action potential is conducted primarily by sodium channels, letting sodium come into the cell. That depolarizes the cell, meaning depolarize. It previously was polarized, having a very negative charge. Depolarization means to move that charge closer to normal, closer to zero. Well, anyways, depolarization activates these calcium channels and at the beginning of the axon terminal. These are called voltage-gated calcium channels because there's been a change in voltage and that lets calcium come into the cell. You need to know that voltage-gated calcium channels are activated by depolarization and they send calcium into the cell. When that calcium comes into the cell, into the cell cytoplasm over here, it causes the neurotransmitter to be released. So things that let calcium come into the cell or that keep calcium concentration in the cytoplasm high are a big, 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 big deal, okay? And everything I'm saying here, it's all going to build on itself. This lecture is a little complicated. You might want to watch it more than once. You might want to watch it in parts. But when you, when I'm done with this lecture here, uh, you're going to have a, a more advanced understanding of the, the brain than any neuro regular neurologist is going to have. Because uh, I talk to neurologists all the time, and they know a lot of stuff. They know all kinds of weird things about brain physiology, about nerve physiology, about epilepsy, drugs, and stuff. But they do not have a good understanding of excitotoxicity and cytoplasm calcium. I tell you that with 100% confidence. I've gone through the books, the big 1,700-page textbooks of the Ivy League and other uh, big-name universities, and... They suck, okay? They'll have a paragraph on excitotoxicity when it's probably the most important thing in all the neuroscience, okay? If you want to prevent dementia and these problems. And they're just clueless. They don't know anything about um, nutrition. Um, they know next to nothing about toxicology. Okay, so anyways, we talked about this, how the cell works. The potassium sodium ATPase generates an electrochemical gradient. Electrical because a negative charge inside the cell chemical because much more sodium outside the cell than inside the cell. And the same thing with calcium, much more calcium outside the cell than inside the cell. And this same gradient used to power almost everything the cell does related to its plasma membrane. Okay, now here's the neurotransmission component. We're going to build on this. So GLU, GLU stands for glutamate. Glutamate is 90% of brain neurotransmitters are glutamate, okay? Then about five, and glutamate is the activator. It's like turning on a light switch. Then you probably heard of GABA. GABA is turning the light switch off. That's about 5% of neurotransmitters. And then the other famous neurotransmitters that everybody talks about all the time are actually really, really kind of scarce. There's only 1% of neurotransmitters approximately that are due to serotonin or dopamine or acetylcholine or norepinephrine. Okay, so anyways, glutamate is the money. Glutamate here 
is released in the synaptic cleft. It diffuses across the synaptic cleft. It binds the first receptor called an AMPA receptor, and that lets sodium come into the postsynaptic neuron. The increased sodium going in depolarizes the neuron. That will cause magnesium to bounce out of the center of this other uh, receptor here. This receptor is called the NMDA receptor. You'll sometimes hear it called N MDAR, okay, for NMDAR, R is for receptor. Okay, but you need to know that magnesium is sitting in the center of it blocking it. That's why a person with a magnesium deficiency will have this less effectively blocked. So that's bad. You don't want that. Magnesium is in the center of chlorophyll. Just eat your plant food, you get your magnesium. Okay, so anyways, when this is depolarized, magnesium bounces away out of the center, and now calcium can flow through the NMDA receptor through MDAR. All right, in order for MDAR to be activated, it simultaneously binds glutamate. Also, it binds glycine. The glycine tends to just be readily available. And one of the little secrets I'm going to tell you, we're going to come to it in a moment, is glyphosate is glycine phosphate. Glyphosate, you can call it, sprayed on GMO um, soy, for example. Another reason why I think soy is a bad idea. And that also increases activation of MDAR, meaning that they let more calcium into the postsynaptic neuron. You don't want anything that lets calcium into the postsynaptic neuron. Anything that increases activation of MDAR is an excitotoxin. Okay. Other things that are a problem, if you have cortisol that will stimulate the presynaptic neuron, it'll release more glutamate. Caffeine increases cortisol, so caffeine will increase glutamate. Psychological stress increases cortisol, increases glutamate. S uh, sleep deprivation, when you're tired because you didn't sleep enough, that increases cortisol, increases glutamate transmission. So all of those things are working against you. You know, if you have to drive in traffic, yeah, you better drink some caffeine to wake you up, okay? But other than that, caffeine is usually a bad idea. Get in the habit of going to bed earlier at night. Okay, so a couple things you, you need to get from this slide is that the MDAR, NMDA receptor, lets calcium in. And normally that's wonderful. That's how the brain works. But if you let too much calcium in because you're overactivating this and have other simultaneous things going on, excessive calcium in the cytoplasm leads to activation of things like calpain, and that's a great name for it, calcium and pain. It's calcium activated and it's painful consequence. It starts destroying things. It'll destroy the NACA exchanger, for example, and then you can't effectively pump calcium out of the cell, and this postsynaptic neuron is screwed. It'll die through uh, what's called excitotoxicity, overactivation, overstimulation, inducing you know all kinds of negative pathways that just cause a neuron to die. Okay, I remember M for magnesium, M for mellow. It is good. It protects you from uh, excessive activation of MDAR. Okay, um, now some stuff from this article about um, the 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 uh, synapses in the brain, the glutamate synapses. Corticosteroids will increase glutamate, and they also increase aspartate. Uh, let's say in the hippocampus, and it's a big deal because aspartate is also an excitatory neurotransmitter. Aspartate, you can think of that as coming from aspartame in the you know, external artificial way. So at a normal synapse, what happens is the glutamate, here's the glutamate stored in vesicles. These are v glut is, is vesicles of glutamate. The glutamate is released into the synapse. It diffuses across, binds the AMPA, like I said, depolarizes the cell. That helps activate MDAR. MDAR is sort of like a coincident receptor for glycine, for glutamate, and for simultaneously being current sensitive. It's also partially voltage gated. Anyways, that lets calcium into the cell, and that activates the postsynaptic neuron. Afterwards, the glutamate is taken up from the synaptic cleft by the adjacent atros, atros, um, astrocyte. This is called a tripartite glutamate synapse. So the uh, astrocyte, the supporting cell, kind of like the mama cells of the brain, it will take up the glutamate, and then it actually converts it to glutamine, sends it back to the neuron, and it's, in a sense recycles it. That's all good. This is what normally should happen. Okay, now here's what cortisol does. So cortisol binds to the GR receptor. That GR stands for glucocorticoid. Glucocorticoid. Cortisol is a glucocorticoid. It increases glucose in the blood. But anyways, it also increases glutamate transmission at neurons. So it'll bind to a receptor on the presynaptic neuron and cause more uh, glutamate, glutamate vesicles to go to the synaptic membrane in the presynaptic cleft and send them in there into the synaptic cleft and cause activation of the post -synaptic. So you need to know that. Cortisol increases glutamate release in the brain. And of course, what increases cortisol? Psychological stress, 
sleep deprivation, and caffeine. These are reasons why I don't drink caffeine anymore. Caffeine has multiple bad effects on the brain. It's much worse than people realize. And people always tell me, well, you know, some joker said that, you know, uh, caffeine is good for you, coffee is good for you, the sleep expert said coffee is good for you. And that's why I'm telling you, unless medicine goes back to sort of like a Bible-based Christian worldview, it will always suck because you have to want to do what's right even when there's financial and popularity incentives to the contrary. Like I said, you know, the sleep expert guy, Matthew Walker, who's pretty smart and he seems nice, but he, he BSs the public. He, he says caffeine's okay, it's not that big of a deal, because he has to. If he said that coffee and tea is for chumps, he would, his popularity would drop to nothing on the internet, and he wouldn't, no one would want to interview him anymore, and corporations wouldn't promote or sponsor him at all. And the same thing with all these other guys, because you're going to see all these guys that... They're playing like some type of game with the public, like the 60-40 game. When I say 60-40, they tell you 60% good information, 40% BS, and in that way they gain some trust. So you watch their videos and they lie to you about stuff that they have to sell and promote to keep their sponsors, okay? I don't have any sponsors. My channel's not monetized. Nobody wants to interview me. I'm the bad boy of veganism because I tell you the truth, okay? And why do I do it? Because I'm an egomaniac and because I'm a Christian and I want to be the best doctor in the world, okay? So that's why I do it. I'm not that nice, okay? I want to help the proles. I'm just a pro myself. But I'm telling you, that's why truth is so rare um, in, in, in conventional healthcare or in education because there isn't money in the truth. There's an aesthetic beauty in it, uh, but there's not money. And, you know, everybody wants money. Okay, here's the effect of chronic stress. When you have chronic psychological stress, some bad things happen. You will start to decrease the astrocyte's ability to clear the glutamate. EAA is just means excitatory amino acids. Glutamate's an amino acid, so, so is aspartate, so is glycine, so is cysteine. So they're all called excitatory amino acids. Okay, it, will, it normally clears them from the synaptic cleft. And again, it converts the glutamate to glutamine, sends it back to the neuron, recycles it so it can be used again. All right, well, when you're not adequately clearing the glutamate from the synapse, it starts to accumulate and it starts to spill over around the synapse. And you actually have these NMDA receptors that are extrasynaptic, meaning they're outside of the synapse. These ones especially are more prone to having, uh, allowing too much calcium to come into the cell, leading to excitotoxicity. So you don't want that. So chronic psychological stress starts damaging brain cells and if it persists for too long and is too severe, it can cause uh, progressive loss of, of brain cells, of neurons, due to excitotoxicity. So excitotoxicity, excito means to excite the neuron, to stimulate it, to make it active. And if you overactivate it, it just gets too much cytoplasm calcium, activates the destruction pathways like calpain, and it goes into apoptosis. Apoptosis means programmed cell death. It's a type of cell death where the cell dies kind of gradually. And because it's dying gradually, it can recycle its chemical components and they can be shipped to other cells to use. But you don't want to be losing your brain cells from apoptosis. And apoptosis is the main way the brain loses neurons. I say this because I've seen many thousands of demented brains, cognitively impaired brains. And the most common thing I see is just the brain is shrunken. It's atrophic. I hardly ever see the so-called Alzheimer pattern of uh, medial temporal lobe, parietal lobe, um, exaggerated atrophy. I don't that often see multi-infarct dementia. Many of these patients have very little periventricular flare hyperintensities, you meaning silent strokes. So what I'm trying to tell you, it ain't the strokes, okay? It ain't the Alzheimer's. They're, they're dying because they're losing brain cells due to apoptosis, okay? All right, so uh, besides the, the psychological stress causing increased glutamate release into the synapse, it's also leading to lack of ability to clear the glutamate from the synapse. So that's double bad. This spillover of glutamate from the synapse to extrasynaptic areas, that's called spillover. Okay. And so excessive stress is bad for multiple reasons. And here's some of them. Cortisol is the stress hormone. Again, it's the, the hormone that cranks up blood glucose and blood lipids in the acute emergency stress phase, so you'll have more energy in your blood to, to run, climb a tree, do whatever you got to do. 
uh, in, you know, stress response is made for surviving brief physical problems. You know, our ancestors worried about getting chased by a saber-toothed tiger, saber tiger. When you're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, all that matters is you survive the next, you know, 30 minutes, okay? It doesn't matter your immune system, okay? Your immune system is for tr removing infections and for removing cancer cells. Well, cortisol is going to suppress that because you've got limited energy resources and you don't want to waste them on anything not relevant to surviving the next couple of minutes. So it's going to suppress your immune system. The problem is in the modern world, people are often psychologically stressed for prolonged amounts of time. Okay, and during that time, they're going to have suppression of the immune system. It's the same people often eat high-fat diets, which also suppress the immune system. So a lot of people have suppressed immune systems, okay? The high-fat diets predispose them to hypertension and diabetes. Well, guess what? Cortisol increases blood glucose. It predisposes to diabetes, okay? It also increases blood pressure. So you get that? High-fat meals and psychological stress are, you know, two sides of the same coin, okay? They both mess you up and push you into diabetes and hypertension, Okay? Diabetes and hypertension are the gateway diseases that lead to atherosclerosis, that lead to brain damage, dementia, that lead to coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis, heart attacks, that lead to impotence. They plug up arteries all over the body. I can tell you, if you just told me a patient in a hospital was 55, 60 years of age, I would not even look on the chart. I would automatically, this is automatic, I would assume they are either pre-diabetic or diabetic. I would assume that they are hypertensive, I would assume that they are overweight, I would assume that they have coronary artery disease, and that is a very safe assumption. I see many thousands of patients, and I can tell you, anybody 60 years of age or more in America is diabetic, hypertensive, has coronary artery disease, and is impotent until proven otherwise, okay? And they usually have early cataracts or full-blown cataracts, and they're usually cognitively slow. I don't even need to look in the chart. I just know that automatically from a lot of experience. And I, may, I have internal medicine doctor friends who tell me every single one of their patients 60 and over is cognitively slow. By the way, I'm 60. Okay, now here's some other bad stuff that cortisol does. So you're psychologically stressed out that causes increase, increased release of cortisol from the adrenal glands. It's a whole pathway through the hypothalamus gets activated, but it leads to increased cortisol. Other bad things cortisol does is it causes leaky gut there's a component of leaky gut thought due to vasoconstriction. You shut down blood supply to the gut because you don't need to be digesting food. You just need to be surviving the next 30 minutes. But chronic psychological stress, you can have prolonged shutdown of blood flow to the gut. Um, and the cortisol effect. So when you get increased gut permeability, unfortunately, you tend to simultaneously get disrupted blood-brain barrier. You get increased leaky brain. Normally, we have a blood-brain barrier to prevent toxic chemicals from getting into the brain parenchyma, the brain tissue, because brain cells need a precise microenvironment, neuronal milieu, in order to function effectively, to be able to fire their action potentials as desired correctly. Okay, but also remember, eating dietary fiber, the gut bacteria use that to produce butyrate. The butyrate maintains tight junction of the intestinal lining cells. Well, guess what? Some of that butyrate goes in the blood, and it's used to maintain tight junctions on the blood-brain barrier. So again, you see how diet goes hand in hand with good health and good brain health. So what I'm saying here is when you're psychologically stressed, you're predisposing yourself to leaky gut. So if somebody has autoimmune disease and it's refractory to a vegan diet avoiding toxins and they still have evidence of autoimmune disease, part of it might be because they're stressed out and that could be causing leaky gut. There's a lot of things that cause leaky gut. I have an entire separate lectures on it that show like about 20, 25 things that cause leaky gut. If I had autoimmune disease, I'd go through that entire list and uh, prevent all those things. I avoid all of them anyways, but that's something a person could do in that situation. Anyways, this is an important point. Psychological stress causes leaky gut and it causes leaky blood-brain barrier to a degree. And that's bad because now if a toxin gets across your open gut lining, it has increased access to your brain because your brain also has a leaky blood-brain barrier. Okay, here's some more articles. Mechanism of blood-brain barrier protection by microbiota. That means gut bacteria derived short-chain fatty acids. Yeah, it's butyrate. Here they are. Short-chain fatty acids, mainly butyrate, okay, produced by bacteria in the gut, are important to preserve blood-brain barrier integrity. Okay, you need that. So here's your blood-brain barrier. Here's a capillary running through the brain. Here's the tight junctions uh, between these capillary cells, okay, these endothelial cells of the blood-brain barrier. And if you don't have enough butyrate because you're not eating your dietary fiber, you're doing other things that are bad for it, like NSAIDs, excessive dietary fat, dietary oils, and all that, you're putting yourself at increased risk for leaky blood-brain barrier, okay? 
and you don't want that if you want to be smart. Okay, animal foods have no fiber. They're all bad, okay? Plant foods have the fiber, okay? Oil and sugar have no fiber, all right? Um, but oil is not just, sugar is, you know, just pure energy. I don't want to get into sugar right now, but oil, oil is toxic. I would not eat any oil. I personally think all this stuff coming out from all these lightweights and BS artists about olive oil being good for you is total nonsense, and I would avoid it. Okay, um, short-chain fatty acids. Okay, just another article. You'll, you'll find plenty of these. Short-chain fatty acids help protect the hippocampus. Fiber protects the blood-brain barrier, okay? I forget those corn syrup's bad, in part because it's associated with mercury, but short-chain fatty acids are used to maintain the tight junctions of the blood-brain barrier. That's an important point. Dietary fiber protects your brain. And there's a reason for that. The low-fat plant-based diet, it is the species-specific diet, so it makes a whole bunch of things, everything better. Okay, we're going to get a little more now into neuron transmission, some of the problems that can go bad. We talked about if you have excessive glutamate release, you'll get excessive opening of MDAR, excessive calcium coming into the cell, that can activate calpane protease, and that'll destroy things, including the knock exchanger. Then you're screwed because you can't pulp calcium out, the cell's going to die. Also, the influx of calcium activates something called ennose. Ennose means neuron nitric oxide synthase, okay? And it's bound to the MDAR by PSD, PSD95 protein. That's why that's in there. All right, well, a little bit of activation of endnose is good, okay? That's what normally happens. But if you get excessive activation of, um, of endnose, that can lead to excessive nitric oxide inside the neuron more than what you should produce, and that can activate toxic apoptosis pathways as well. We're not going to get into all of those but it really comes down to the main problem is you don't want excessive calcium in your cytoplasm because when it gets really overdone, the neuron's screwed. It's going to die. Okay, now I'm going to go through the same thing but in more detail. There's something called EMF, electromotive force, and you get that like when you put a cell phone right next to your head. It's a low-power microwave transmitter. You don't want to be doing that. Unless it's an emergency and you have to talk privately, you should always use your speakerphone, uh, given a choice. Um, and you probably shouldn't be talking on your phone so much, and you probably should get a landline phone if possible, okay? Um, this is one of the reasons why I don't even own a cell phone, because I was looking at the great authors, and I saw how did they write so much, even though they were so busy. And what I noticed is they all really simplified their life. And so that's what I chose to do, because uh, I don't need it. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm working, I'm working. When I'm on call, I'm on call, but it's all clear cut. And when I'm not on call, I'm not on call. So I don't need to be immediately available. Okay, um, here's some other things going on that are interesting. Aspartate, like from aspartame, that also activates MDAR. Cysteine, the sulfur-containing protein, that also activates MDAR. Glycine phosphate, glyphosate, like the glycine, that can also activate MDAR. BAP, beta amyloid protein, activates MDAR. So what I'm saying is all of these things will increase calcium entry into your neurons. They're bad. Now, what's the deal with BAP? Now, BAP is a little bit of a complex subject, but I'll just give you a simplification of what's relevant to us at the moment. Normally, after insulin is active, after a meal, to help get glucose into the skeletal muscle cells, for example, there's a protein enzyme called insulin-degrading enzyme, and it clears the insulin out of the blood. It has very high affinity for insulin, but guess what? Insulin-degrading enzyme also clears out BAP, beta amyloid protein. If you eat a high-fat diet, you get insulin resistance. The pancreas makes more insulin. Well, guess what? Insulin-degrading enzyme can only be made in fixed amounts. It's not easy to ramp up its production. So you won't have enough insulin-degrading enzyme in your peripheral blood to clear out the BAP because the, the insulin-degrading enzyme normally clears out insulin and BAP, beta amyloid protein. So when you have chronic high insulin levels due to insulin resistance, due to high-fat diets, you're screwing yourself because then you're going to have elevated beta amyloid protein because there's not enough insulin-degrading enzyme to clear it out. It has higher affinity. Insulin-degrading enzyme has higher affinity for the insulin than it does for the BAP. So BAP will go retrograde from the peripheral blood into the brain 
and it can activate MDAR and, and contribute to causing cytotoxicity, okay? This is another reason why diabetics tend to be so stupid. And that's why typical diabetic, they always tell me, oh no, my diabetes, it's going okay, it's under control, it's under control, I'm taking my meds, you know, I've been checking my blood glucose, it's under control. And it's like, no, you dummy, you don't understand. You're doing all kinds of secondary damage all over your body and you want to minimize that. And the way you min minimize it is fix your diet. And as you fix your diet, if you've got any insulin production left, you've got a good chance to come off your insulin or at least markedly reduce it. Why not do that? Why take pills the rest of your life when you can cure yourself? Okay, so we talked about this, how you need a lot of ATP energy to pump calcium out of the cell or to pump it in the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so these pumps, what they're like is the calcium flooding into the cell is like water at the bottom of a boat, okay? Now, these guys bailing the water out of the boat, they're kind of like the NACA exchanger, the pl plasma membrane calcium ATPase, and the circa, okay, the circa sarcoplasm endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. They need to do their job and get that water out of the boat. If you get too much water in the boat, the boat will sink, okay? So what I'm saying is these guys need lots of energy, and that energy comes from ATP. If they don't have enough energy, these guys can't work. If something's inhibiting them, they can't work, okay? And this is, what, this is what's going on in a neuron. Now, water flooding into the boat is like the calcium flooding into a neuron. And I'll just show you a couple papers. There's just so many things that mess up neurons. Neurons are delicate, like titanium, titanium dioxide nanoparticles. They often put these in medications. They put them in sunscreens. They put them in some toothpaste. They put them in some cosmetics. You don't want to be rubbing this crap on yourself, okay? That's another reason why I'm a minimalist. The only cosmetic thing in my whole bathroom, I have one bar of transparent soap. That's it. I seldom even brush my teeth. Uh, I usually just floss. I floss every night. I'm careful about that, and I don't eat sweets or acidic foods. But and the toothpaste I use is one of those non F minus uh, with the fewest possible ingredients. All right. So next thing to oh another article: titanium nanoparticles decreasing uh, spermatogenesis. They also damage mitochondria. All right, they're bad. Um, they're, I think they're penetration enhancers for uh, sunscreen. Okay, now here is just basic metabolism. Glucose comes into a cell, undergoes glycolysis, produces pyruvate, that gets sent to the mitochondria, Krebs cycle runs on the mitochondrial matrix, and then it produces electron carriers like NADH, FADH. Those send electrons to the inner mitochondrial membrane. This is the outer mitochondrial membrane. Here's the inner mitochondrial membrane. The space in between is the intramembranous space. And then electron transport passes the electrons along until they're used to make ATP. That's human metabolism, and the vast majority of our ATP comes from the mitochondria. Okay, here's a normal mitochondria. It's like a fireman bucket brigade, and they pass the electrons down um, until it reaches the, the final carrier, complex number four, and then the electrons are given to oxygen, and that's used to make water, H2O. Okay, You need to give four electrons to oxygen uh, to make water. Meanwhile, the hydrogen protons are pumped at these complexes into the intramembranous space between the outer mitochondrial membrane up here and the inner mitochondrial membrane down here. So what I'm trying to tell you is, you know, I often talk to ignoramuses who tell me, oh, you know, the body just developed itself. You don't need God to make the human body. And I'm like, look, I've studied this all my life in tremendous detail. I'm telling you, the human body is so much smarter than humans are. It's not even funny. Do you realize what's happening here on the inner mitochondrial membrane? They have split the atom. They take a hydrogen atom and they split it. They take the proton component with the nucleus and they pump that into the intermembranous space. Meanwhile, they take the external orbiting electron of a hydrogen and they send it around the, um, the uh, electron carriers of the inner mitochondrial membrane. So what I'm telling you, just look what I've already told you in this lecture. Inside of the mitochondria, we have split the atom and used that to generate energy. That's incredible. And I just told you, on the plasma membrane, we created an electrical current with an electrical battery system. So what I'm trying to say is, however many thousands or millions of years ago it was that life on Earth was created by God, he had to split the atom <laughs> and he had to create electrical currents, okay? Do you think that happened spontaneously because a, a lightning bolt, you know, uh, crashed on a puddle of water? I don't think so, all right? And having a sense of awe about it 
uh, helps you to understand it. You know, you get the smartest humans on the planet, you know, and they dedicate their entire life to studying this stuff. They're going to figure out one or two, at the most, three things. Okay, that's it, because it's way too complicated. And so to think that, you know, all this could spontaneously happen. It's ridiculous. You know, imagine you go to the beach and you see your name written in the sand. You know an intelligent person wrote your name. Well, if it takes intelligence to write your name, whatever that is, five or ten letters on the sand, then how is, how is spontaneously 3.3 billion DNA base pairs going to be written to create a human? Come on, it's ridiculous. All right, let's continue here with the inner mitochondrial membrane. I started coming across inhibitors of <clears throat> inner mitochondrial membrane electron transport. I knew fat did that. That's what causes insulin resistance. You can look at the Michael Brownlee paper, Unifying Theory of Diabetic Complications, <clears throat> a beautiful, magnificent paper. And I started encountering more papers, random papers where <clears throat> glyphosate inhibited complex 2, cadmium inhibiting complex 3, lead's inhibiting cytochrome C, F- minus inhibiting complex 4, Hydroxy nonanol toxic aldehydes from omega-6 cooking oils, lipid peroxidation, inhibiting ATP synthase. And I'm like, holy crap, this mitochondrial inhibition is a big deal. So I went back to my biochemistry books. I own about seven of them. And I started looking up mitochondrial inhibition, but I couldn't find anything. I'm like, what the heck is this? It's not taught. Because I knew I didn't remember anything. I was a really good student. And so I'm like, how come this was never taught? Then I start going into literature, and I'm like, holy crap. I quickly found over 50 over 50 mitochondria inhibitors. Okay, well, here's just one more thing. I want to show you. If you have elevated uh, free iron because you're iron overloaded, as most men are after they're in their 20s, most women after they're postmenopausal, after 55, let's say, most men after 25, this can also, uh, the, the iron can ferrous redox cycle and give electrons to uh, things like hydrogen peroxide. And you can run the Fenton reaction and generate really toxic free radicals like hydroxic radical, which can trash inner mitochondrial membranes like the cardiolipin, fatty uh, phospholipids and destroy mitochondria. So excess free iron also leaves this problem. This is another reason why I try to keep my serum fair and low. Mine's about 110 now. I've been working it down. It previously was much higher. The ideal level is about 30 to, to 80. So you don't want to be iron overloaded. Okay. Now fungicides that are widely used in processed food because they don't want mold to grow in it and they're used on a lot of things. Um, they also are mitochondria inhibitors very often. Okay, I'm about to get to the big slide. I'm working towards it. One more. Okay, food dyes that they put in processed food to make it look nice. They're also mitochondria inhibitors very often. Um, in this one study of four different types of antidepressants, all of them were mitochondrial inhibitors. That's why I laugh. You know, one of the biggest problems for the brain is being able to generate enough energy. So then you're going to give it these antidepressant drugs that inhibit mitochondrial uh, electron transport. Are you out of your freaking mind? Okay, you're going to drop the ability of that brain cell to make ATP. You think that's going to make that brain cell better? No, they're going to have trouble pumping the calcium out of their uh, cytoplasm, that's going to cause problems for brain cells. And that's why the greatest psychiatrists who ever lived, they will tell you that these antidepressants and most of these other psych meds, they all cause a chemical lobotomy. You're losing brain cells, okay? That's a lobotomy to lose brain cells. It happens gradually, but it happens. Okay, here's another one. I find these articles funny. They're so, they're, they're so sort of amazing. Fluoxetine, that's Prozac. It induces undesirable effects such as anxiety, sexual dysfunction, and sleep disturbance. It can interfere with cells and, and cause apoptosis. It has been associated with increased cancer risk. Now, here's a great one. Fluoxetine interacts with mitochondria, causing apoptosis, causing apoptosis. That means cell death. It's about you. People think that this drug is helping your brain. It kills your brain cells, okay? Have I made myself clear? Prozac causes apoptosis in brain cells. <laughs> It damages the mitochondria, okay? That's a disaster. It's a disaster, all right? And here's when I, well, I said I looked it up. Over 50 mitochondrial inhibitors, and they're common. Tylenol, you ever heard of that? Atrazine, sprayed on GMO corn. Glyphosate, sprayed on GMO soy. That's why I only eat organic, and I never eat soy. Okay, metformin, very common diabetes medication. Mercury, which is used very commonly, contaminates high fructose corn syrup. I never eat processed food. Trichloroethylene, the chemical for the dry cleaner. That's why I never go to the dry cleaner. 
antifungals, mold inhibitors. We talked about that. We talked about titanium dioxide nanoparticles like in sunscreens and cosmetics and some medications. Propofol, a common sedative, okay? Statins, used to lower cholesterol. Perhaps that's why they increase the risk of diabetes. Perhaps that's why they increase the risk of cognitive impairment. And that's why I would never take one of these things. I control my cholesterol just by eating a low-fat diet. Okay, what? PFOAs. PFOAs are like on the nonstick pans. I would never cook on that nonstick cookware. I think that's for stupid chumps. A lot of that stuff's related to Teflon. I, I would never use that stuff, okay? Um, mining and welding can uh, have toxic chemicals released that are damaging to the mitochondria. A lot of antibiotics, fluoroquinolones, you know, they got fluoride in them, but other antibiotics too, beta-lactams, aminoglycosides, are all toxic to mitochondria, tetracyclines. Um, there's other things that are toxic to Krebs cycle, which end up being toxic to mitochondria. Alcohol, for example, traumatic brain injury. Uh, so all of these things push a person towards having impaired cognitive function. We talked about flame retardants, um, excessive iron. We talked about how that leads to Fenton reactions, destruction of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Aluminum is toxic to mitochondria as well. They put that in the water and it forms synergistic complexes with F- minus that increase the risk of brain damage. Gee, do you think that is, is you know, something that's being done to help you? All right, uh, more stuff. Fluoxetine induces necrosis by causing energy depletion. Your mitochondria don't work. Mitochondrial calcium overload, which kills the mitochondria. That's a freaking disaster. I don't have the paper right here, but there's papers that show that recommend fluoxetine Prozac be used for chemotherapy. Okay, this is just a bigger slide showing all these things that uh, mitochondria inhibitors and how terrible they are. Well, you get it. All these things inhibit your mitochondria. How are you going to make ATP to pump that calcium out of your cytoplasm? So you see how the brain cell is screwed. So imagine you take some poor, depressed person, right? And you put them on an antidepressant medication, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor that inhibits their mitochondria's ability to um, produce ATP. And simultaneously, they're eating processed food with the high fructose corn syrup in there with the mercury contamination, and that's inhibiting their mitochondria. They're a little bit fat. They got a little bit of mild diabetes. They put them on metformin. That's inhibiting their mitochondria, okay? Their cholesterol's high. They put them on a statin. That's inhibiting their mitochondria. Gee, I wonder why they're stupid. Okay, now there's lots of things uh, causing increased calcium in the cytoplasm. We talked about, you know, cell phones. All these things are opening up voltage-gated calcium channels and they're gonna to contribute to increased calcium in the cytoplasm. And then stimulants will do it. Caffeine will do it for several reasons. Uh, monosodium glutamate, MSG, because it's because of the glutamate, manufactured free glutamate. Um, I talked about that in my last lecture on the top books with the Fat, Sick, and Stress book by Catherine Reed. Aspartame, the sweetener, uh, some of the drugs we just talked about, psychological drugs, psychiatric drugs, the stress, the sleep deprivation, uh, lack of magnesium. The magnesium keeps that MDAR blocked. That's why you want good magnesium. Um, I only take vitamin B12 methylcobalamin, but if I ever took another supplement, it would probably be magnesium. I know my magnesium is good, but magnesium is the one thing I, people are very, very often deficient in magnesium. Okay, so the thing to do is eat your plants. Um, corticosteroid medications, opening up MDAR, not good. Okay, what are other things going on? If you eat excessive dietary sodium relative to potassium, we talked about that in regard to hypertension in my hypertension lectures, you can partially dissipate, more so in the periphery than in the brain, you partially dissipate that sodium electrochemical gradient and its power of its uh, knockout exchanger. So you don't want to do that, okay? We talked about all those mitochondrial inhibitors that are going to prevent us from having enough ATP to lower this cytoplasm calcium. We talked about things that smell bad or things that cause diabetes getting you into a vicious cycle, worsening, uh, lowering circa function, that's going to increase uh, calcium in your cytoplasm. There's a lot of things going south, okay? You don't want that. Oh, calcine, caffeine does so many bad things. It's a vasoconstrictor, decreases blood supply to the brain. It also opens up what are called the ryanodine. Uh, these are calcium channels on the uh, endoplasmic reticulum that let calcium exit the endoplasmic reticulum and go into the cytoplasm. So it does that too. So that's three major bad things calcium does to brain cells. It vasoconstricts blood supply of the brain, number one. Number two, caffeine causes increased glutamate transmission because it elevates cortisol, so increased glutamate transmission in your neuron synaptic junctions, okay? And number three, it causes release of calcium from your endoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm uh, via these ryanodine uh, receptors. So it's all bad. 
All right, um, some other interesting things. Oh, polychlor polychloral biphenyls, a common pollutant accumulated in water that's unfiltered, that will also open up, same thing like caffeine does, these ryanodine uh, calcium channels on the endoplasmic reticulum, and that sends calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum, from the endoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm. That's another reason why you want filtered water. That's another reason why I think it's stupid when people go, oh, everyone should drink eight cups a day. Oh, BS. An 80-pound lady needs to drink the same amount of water as a 350-pound lineman. And what kind of water are they drinking? Is it full of estrogenic chemicals making them fat? Is it full of PCBs screwing up, you know, contributing to brain damage here? I wouldn't randomly drink it. You know, water, they put F-minus in it and aluminum. Those are both brain neurotoxins. PCB is a brain neurotoxin, Okay. Being estrogen overload predisposes to weight gain, hypertension, and diabetes, which are bad for the brain. Okay, this is just a slide showing what causes increased calcium in the cytoplasma and what gets rid of it. We already talked about the plasma membrane calcium ATPase pumps it out, the NACA exchanger pumps calcium out, and the circa pumps get it into the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, here's another article. Caffeine is associated with increased calcium release from the endoplasmic reticulum to the cytoplasm. Oh, and here I just have a slide. So here's the endoplasmic reticulum. Here's showing caffeine will increase the calcium exiting the endoplasmic reticulum and going into the cytoplasm. That's bad. Uh, beta amyloid protein activates MDAR receptors. We talked about that. BAP will activate MDAR, and BAP is increased. Beta amyloid protein is increased in the brain when you have high insulin level because it ties up your... Uh, Insulin degrading enzyme, so it's not there's not none left to clear out the BAP, and it goes from the periphery into the brain because it wasn't cleared out by IDE, uh, insulin degrading enzyme. Okay, um, EMF opens up voltage gated calcium channels, and of course cortisol would bind right here and increase calcium, and it would lead to increased glutamate transmission. So all that stuff's bad. So basically, EMF's a little bit like cortisol being bound there, a similar effect is had. Okay, so you want to do all the things in life that make you healthy. Avoid all the things that make you unhealthy. So get your sleep, get your exercise, maintain your stress, have a purpose in life, have a sense of meaning in your life, whatever that is uh, for you um, that will help you. You know, for a lot of people, you know, it's to help their kids. That gives them meaning in life. Well, that's good, okay? If they're a coach, to coach their team. If they're a teacher, to teach their students, okay? Um, if they're a medical genius like me, to write academic books, okay? Everybody has their own purpose, whatever it might be, and that greatly improves their psychological health because what happens is there's inevitable sadness, disappointments, and failures, and setbacks, and we get treated unfairly on certain things. But as long as you say, well, at least I'm still alive, and I'll continue to try to help my kids or to coach my students, to coach my athletes, coach my, teach my students, whatever, Having that purpose gives you the resilience to keep going strong. And also having a God-based worldview, you know, um, that also helps too. An attitude of gratitude makes people healthier. The healthiest people in the world, you know, the blue zones and whatnot, they're religious, they're social. These are normal things, all right? All the, most of this modern stuff is bad. Most of this modern stuff is to be avoided. Okay, what's this? Something about the... Okay, just that stress is bad. We're not going to get into this one. Oh, and I actually meant to put this slide earlier. So all roads lead to Rome in Italy. And what I was kind of talking about is in your uh, cell cytoplasm and your neurons, it's kind of like all roads lead to increased cytoplasm calcium. So if you just do what the average stupid person does, you're going to end up calcium overloaded, losing brain cells, and just be fat, sick, and stupid by the time you're 60. That's why you don't want to be... Um, you don't want to be average. You don't want to be normal. Because I have a lot of people, I'm not going to name any names here, but who pressure me. They go, you're so abnormal. Why don't you try to be more normal? And what I say is, a normal average person's like a mental retard compared to me. Why would I want to behave like a mental retard? All these people, they eat junk food, they drink alcohol, they smoke cigarettes, they make themselves sick, and you try talking to them and talking some sense into them about becoming a vegan, and they look at you like you're crazy. Why would I want to be like them? Because I know I have doctors who give me a hard time about why I'm a low-fat vegan. And I say, well, look, who's aging better, me or you, okay? I mean, there's no comparison. Out of all the doctors I know, I'm 60, I'm aging better than every single one of them. There's one guy who's about 55, I know, and he's like does triathlons and he's really healthy, and he's aging great for his age, okay? He also eats pretty good. Not as good as me, but pretty good. 
Okay, we talked about all this, normal neuron at rest. I'll hide you. This one's nice because I included the, the pump here to pump calcium outside the cell, also through the plasma membrane calcium ATPase. But that's a minor thing. Knock exchanger is way faster than the plasma membrane calcium ATPase. Okay, we talked about the guys pumping in the boat. Oh, now here's sort of an official summary slide of my theory. So this is the Peter Rogers MD theory of dementia. I started out calling it the neurovascular uncoupling theory, but that's a little complicated for people. It's a supply and demand theory. Basically, you have a neuron with an MR. That's a metabolic rate of the neuron. If you take a stimulant like caffeine, sleep deprivation, psychological stress, tobacco, amphetamines, all of those will increase the metabolic rate of that neuron. Attention deficit meds, which are amphetamines. Um, if, you, if you ingest excitotoxins, things like aspartame, uh, glyphosate, you know, GP, um, if you, you know, eat the high fat diet so your insulin is elevated and you can't clear BAP, all those things will have an excitotoxin effect, overstimulation of the neuron. And when that happens, the metabolic rate of the neuron goes up like this. Well, you're going to need a compensatory increase in glucose and oxygen delivery. I jokingly abbreviated this GOD uh, for glucose oxygen delivery. Most of the, in most papers, you'll see it called OGD, oxygen glucose delivery, which basically means blood flow, blood flow. You need good blood flow. And if you're going to have increased metabolic rate in a neuron, it goes from here up to here, you're going to need compensatory increased oxygen and glucose delivery to maintain that metabolic rate. But there's things that decrease the blood flow to the brain. If you get atherosclerosis in the arteries of your brain due to hypertension and diabetes most commonly and high-fat diets, you're not going to get as much glucose and oxygen delivered to your brain cells. They're going to be less able to make ATP. Well, if you got atrial fibrillation, congestive heart failure, aortic regurgitation, aortic stenosis, you're going to have less pump pressure to get blood to your brain. And this is kind of like what was talked about with the Jack Delatory theory, okay? If you inhibit circa, you're not going to be able to pump uh, calcium out of the cell cytoplasm, meaning you're going to have the effect of increasing the metabolic rate. If you don't have functioning mitochondria, you can't make ATP to pump the... Um, calcium out of the cytoplasm, so that's going to have the effect of increasing your metabolic rate. That's all bad. Um, if you don't have uh, adequate amount of dietary uh, potassium and magnesium, you're not going to be able to run your calcium, I'm sorry, your potassium, sodium, ATP pumps very well, because you need magnesium for the ATP. You need the potassium to be pumped into the cell, and if you dissipate that gradient, you're not going to be able to pump calcium out of the cell effectively. If you're iron overloaded, as so many people are, you're going to run into a problem with uh, generating more hydroxyl radicals and destroying your mitochondria. So this is, what, this is what kills people. This is why so many people are stupid. And look at all, almost all of these things are easily fixed. Don't eat a high fat diet, okay? If you eat a starch-based, low fat, vegan diet, you'll probably have pretty good blood pressure. Don't be overloaded with sodium, okay? Don't, don't add much sodium. You can add a little bit of salt to your food, but not that much. Don't eat processed food. That's the main spot where people get it. Okay, get your exercise, get your sleep. Okay, don't be taking any of these stimulants. Don't use artificial sweeteners like aspartame. Um, if you just avoid these things, you avoid all these problems. Okay, take good care of your, your teeth. All right, I don't have, I haven't been to a dentist in over 26 years. I say that because when I look at demented brains, I almost always see that they've had unilateral or bilateral cataract surgery, and they almost always have poor teeth, okay? They all go together. If you have poor teeth, you get leaky gums, and you get postprandial endotoxemia. I'm not going to go into all that right now. I've gone into that before, but that's another manifestation of leaky gut. So you want to make sure you're getting your dietary fiber so you don't get the problem of leaky blood-brain barrier due to lack of dietary fiber, leaky gut due to uh, lack of dietary fiber, and amyloidogenic clotting due to lack of dietary fiber. They all go together. And I think what was unique about me, like why could I figure all this out? Because I know nutrition, because I know toxicology. You'll get some PhD and they're going to work on one tiny little aspect of this, okay? But I was able to figure out the whole thing, the nutrition, the toxicology, the neurophysiology, the metabolism, every single aspect of it. I, I could figure the whole thing out. And I did. And that's why I have the best theory in the world of what causes dementia. The Peter Rogers MD theory of dementia, the supply and demand theory of dementia. This is just a summary of it, and I had to give this lecture to a bunch of doctors, and look at the mnemonic I wrote, boast. I go, yeah, I'm bragging because I figured out better than all your medical textbooks, all your stupid neurology textbooks. I figured it out better, okay? And all these docs will tell me, oh, you're so right, you're so great, but then you know what? No one ever invites me. 
I've never been invited to speak before. If there's any neurologists out there listening, why don't you invite me to give this lecture? Okay, if there's any internal medicine doctors out there, why don't you invite me to give this lecture over the internet to your group? And I know they never will. They're a bunch of chicken shits because they know that this changes the paradigm of management. This will create extra work for them. They're not going to get reimbursed to sit there educating the patient for this. Because I, I like neurologists. The ones I know, they're real nice. They're smart. I like them. But they've been trained to match the elder to pill and send a bill. And they don't know nutrition. They don't know toxicology. They don't know any of this stuff. Uh, despite the fact that this is the foundational stuff of the brain. Okay. I found, I figured all this stuff out by reading on my own. Um, it's not in the books. Okay. This is just a little more detail. Is there anything interesting here? Um, oh, when you get a stroke or ischemia of a brain cell, you don't get enough oxygen going to your mitochondria, so they can't make ATP. So that's why ischemia destroys brain cells. It leads to apoptosis. Okay, uh, let's see. We talked about the effect of endnose to make uh, nitric oxide, and that can become excessive. All right, we're winding down. I do got to go through a little more stuff here, but we're winding down. All right. Um, I'm not going to go into mitochondria components of toxicity with diabetics. Um, high fat diets are just bad. I mean, brain cells can't metabolize that stuff. What improves mood? We talked about this. You know, get your exercise, get your sunshine, get your sleep, maintain some social support with family and friends. It's good to be religious. All the people from the major religions, they all live longer. Have a purpose in your life. Oh, I like this. Thomas Shaw's said that. Young and Adler were an improvement on Freud, but they didn't go far enough. The key is meaning. Meaning is what sets people free. That's Thomas Shaw's, the great uh, psychiatrist. And he's not the only one who figured that out. Fyodor Dostoevsky figured that out. Thomas, uh, Arthur Schopenhauer figured that out. Arthur Schopenhauer said, forget about it, a happy life and try to live a heroic life. Because if you live consistent with your personal values, then you'll like yourself and you'll be happy. Okay, as happy as you're going to be. You know, we're not going to get, uh, you know, a million dollars to go live on our own tropic island, island and do whatever we want, okay? <laughs> this is not going to happen. You're going to have all your chores and all your burdens, but at least if you do the best you can with them, you will like yourself. All right, and there's the whole, you know, Viktor Frankl quote, Fyodor Dostoevsky. They all said the same thing. And, Ty, and Watson and Crick, you know, if you live according to your purpose, an animal is happy when it lives according to its purpose. A horse is happy when it runs. You'll be happy. You'll be happy as you're going to be, okay? And the Christianity has a worldview that shows that life has meaning. And the meaning increases your meaning, and it makes you happier. I've seen a lot of atheists just go down the tubes when they ran into a setback or disappointment, commit suicide or drop out of school, drop out of jobs, all kinds of things. Okay, so let's keep going here. We're just about done. Okay, oh, the reality on a, on a personal basis, like other things you do to make yourself better. Well, I said, eat the low-fat vegan diet. Then you get good arteries, good blood flow. Don't add too much sodium. Certainly avoid the processed food. Again, give you better blood flow. Keep moving, get your exercise, better blood flow. Um, no oil, no meat. Make sure you get your dietary fiber. All the good stuff in plant foods. The fiber, the potassium, the magnesium, the nitrate precursors, the nitric oxide, and the antioxidants. All the good stuff. Okay, for handling your stress, having a purpose and a sense of meaning lowers your stress, okay? You sort of feel, even though I got screwed over on a couple things in life, at least I have my purpose, you know, whatever that might be, to help your students, to help your athletes, to help your kids, your family, or whatever, to write your books. Whatever it is, that purpose makes you more resilient and able to tolerate it. If you're an atheist and you say life is meaningless and now I've lost all the few things that I enjoyed, then you don't have a sense of purpose and those guys don't do well. Um, and, you know, be nice to the people you encounter. I like this quote from the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Above all, love each other deeply, for love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to each other. Use whatever gift you have received to help others. And again, I get back to the point is, why is it that a mother and a father are the two best people in the world for a child? Because they love the child. And you can take all the medical, surgical, bullshitology, and technology, and the medical, student, the medical system, the conventional medical system still sucks because the people who run the healthcare system hate the patients, okay? So that's why it can't be good, and it could never be good until it adopts a, ba a Bible-based worldview, and it says that people are more important than money. 
and they're going to have to restructure, be like, you know, the old Kempner Rice Houses or something. They're going to have to add that to all the modern technology. And until they do, it'll never be good. And they're never going to do that because in the short run, that will lose a lot of money. So it's never going to happen. So anybody listening to this, you're stuck with the responsibility that you got to take care of yourself because the system's not going to take care of you other than for, you know, certain less common problems, okay? It's good for treatment of trauma. It's good for you know, certain things. And it is really good for a lot of things, but for most of the common stuff, most people's problem is they're fat, they're diabetic, they're hypertensive, and they got atherosclerosis, and that's causing secondary problems. That's what most patients have. Okay, and you know, being hydrated, that's less important. You get a lot of hydration from plant foods. Okay, uh, we're winding down here. Just, oh, actually, book number 43 is EMF. This is by Mercola. And I know a lot of people think Mercola is a bit of a salesman. He's always selling stuff. But the guy's also smart. And he spent years writing this book. And he researched it pretty carefully. It's the best book on EMF. I've read like about four or five books on that. It's the best one that I've come across. Okay. I give an honorable mention to this other one. Um, I'll show it right here by uh, Martin Blank. He wrote this one. It's decent. It's not as good as Mercola's, but it's still pretty good, and it covers things that Mercola didn't cover, so I think it's worth knowing about. Honorable mention. Okay, now here's a guy who's actually rather fascinating, Martin Paul, and he's sort of a physicist who became secondarily interested in biology, and he especially was interested in EMF, and um, he wrote an interesting book, and this is all goes into the no-oh-no -oh -no pathway, the nitric oxide peroxynitrite pathway. I made a longer lecture of that separately, but if you're interested in understanding very complex disease um, and, and, and uh, you know, free reactive oxygen species, Paul is good to read. He's good to read. He's kind of boring. He's kind of, I think, Asperger autism. And so he talks in a monotone voice. I think the guy's a genius, actually. He talks in a monotone voice that can make it hard to follow his lectures. But he's brilliant, okay? And he has very interesting things to say about this nitric oxide peroxy nitrite cycle, okay? So I do think his book is well worth reading. I think his videos are worth watching. But I would also tell you it takes a serious effort to get through all his stuff. And he explains the difference between enos, ennos, and inos, okay? Ennos is neuronal nitric oxide synthase. Inos is inducible nitric oxide synthase. Enos is endothelial. So enos is the good one that you always want activated, you know, like that um, we talk about Esselstyn for maintaining wide open arteries in the periphery. But endos and inos, you don't want to overdo it. And that's a different story. And that's, that's related to some other things. We're not going to get into that. So I realize that was kind of a long lecture. I hope that was helpful to you. And that concludes books number 41 through 44 of our top 50 medical books of all time.